Coming up on today's Minnesota Sports Rankum, the top five Vikings preseason roster moves of all time. That's next. This is Minnesota Sports Rankum, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota, and it starts now. It's the show that settles debates and starts new ones. It's Minnesota Sports Rankum on Lockdown Sports Minnesota. Every Thursday, myself, Sam Ekstrom, and my sidekick, Luke Inman, putting together top five lists around Minnesota sports, heavily weighted on the Minnesota Vikings this time of year as we try to get to the bottom of some great debates. I'm Sam Ekstrom. I'm at Sam Ekstrom on Twitter, part of the Ron Johnson Show and the Minnesota Football Party here on Lockdown Sports Minnesota. Luke Inman is as well. He's at Luke underscore Spinman, big part of our operation here, and he authors the NFL Draft Buzz newsletter. What's going on, Luke? Hey, feeling good, Sam. Day two of joint practice. Can't wait to pick your brain on the football party coming up with Arif Hassan and Luke Braun coming up next. But yeah, another Thursday, another great list, and another great rankum topic here from you today. So I can't wait to dive in, compare and contrast these lists, see what you got on here. I usually try to find inspiration from current events in these lists, and my inspiration right now is Trey Lance rumors. The Vikings may be in the mix to make a call to the 49ers and trade for the hometown or the home state kid, Trey Lance, and bring him in for as, you know, a future prospect, a flyer they can take to compete for next year. Uh, but uh, basing off of that, we're going to talk about the top five preseason roster moves that we've seen in Vikings history. And as always, please comment below on guys we miss, mistakes we make. Please call us out in the comments on YouTube where you can subscribe for free. Also, we're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. In addition, Sirius XM app, Amazon Fire, Roku, all that jazz. Um, so again, Luke, these are trades. These are surprise cuts, surprising acquisitions, all made in this preseason period where the rumor mill is running so hot. So as always, we start with you with your number five and, and any other disclaimers you might have. I know sometimes you need to preface the list. Well, I'll just say I went back to 2014 for my list, Sam. So I really honed in on the last eight years specifically. And if I learned one thing, it's that this really put things into perspective of just how wild and crazy things are about to get over the next week. And it just goes to show, too, if there's going to be a big move, Sam, it's going to happen right at the end of this month when you get not just the roster cuts trimming from 90 to 53, but when you see some big trades go down as well, this is when they all happen end of August. Let me jump to number five, and I hate to do it. I'm starting out on a somber note, unfortunately. August 2nd, 2021, Vikes released their first round pick from just a season ago, cornerback Jeff Gladney. Now, obviously, what happened afterwards was absolutely heartbreaking. Him mm -hmm. and his girlfriend passed away in that car accident. But at the time, this was a major, major move to part ways with not just a first round player who ah, got him into camp, can't stay healthy, doesn't know. No, this guy started 15 games and looked the part of a future stud cornerback for years to come under Mike Zimmer. Obviously, again, this whole story quickly turned into much more than just football, though. And it was one of those things that, you know, reminded all of us yet again, football's only a game. These guys are real people, real lives. Once they step off that field, tragic end to two people's lives still with a ripple effect, Sam, to this day. I think about guys like Jalen Rager, by the way. Remember, he was extremely close to him from their college days at TCU. Think about everything Jalen Rager has gone through the last few years. It's a lot. So waving Jeff Gladney, their first round pick from just a season ago after he faced those third degree felony assault charges. That was a shocking move, Sam. Comes in at number five on my list. Yeah, that was controversial. And that uh, I had forgotten about that. And I think we're, we're going to encounter this a lot where there's a lot of these moves that kind of, mm -hmm. I think, have slipped through the cracks for me. Uh, so that that's one that certainly had major ripple effects. It's just such a such a bummer, somber note to end on, obviously, not just on the field, but off the field as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and the Cardinals in for joint practices right now. That was his mm. next team, I believe. So a lot of guys uh, there on the field this week probably knew him. All right, my number five. This one is, I think, of the more comical variety. Rick Spielman wanted to solve the kicking issue once and for all. They had drafted Daniel Carlson the year before. 
They cut him after two games, so they wasted a fifth-round pick. And Rick Spielman said, well, why not waste another? I'm going to bring in a kicker slash punter, Corey Vedvik. The Norwegian prodigy was going to solve every issue. Big leg, place kicker, punter. They were going to save a roster spot, Luke. He was going to do both. Corey Vedvik, again, a fifth-round pick. He He was going to do both, Sam. He was going to do a kicker and a putter. And the first day, I do remember, they put him out on a practice field all by himself, and they just said, all right, show off. And he was kicking 80-yard punts, and he was kicking 60-yard field goals, and it was very, very exciting. I remember the crowd was on its feet for Corey Vedvik. Fast forward to the end of that preseason. Didn't really perform in the games. Missed a couple kicks. Dan Bailey wins the job. And the crazy thing is, it's not like, you know, this was a Carlson situation where he floated to the next team and found success and kind of hung around in the league. No, he got one chance. He got one chance with the New York York Jets. And you know what happened? Missed a field goal, missed an extra point, never heard from again. One game. That's all he got in his career. And the Vikings were intent on making him their savior at kicker and punter. They gave up a fifth round pick for him. I should really look this up too. Maybe we can do this really fast. See who the Ravens drafted with that pick because the Vikings gave up mm. 2009 or the 2020 fifth round pick, which turned into Broderick Washington Jr. Stud. Uh, tackle. Yeah. Two sacks in the last three years. So uh, yeah, that's my number five. That's my number five. Hey, just the uh, mindset, though, to be able to have a guy on special teams be able to kick and punt saves you a roster spot. Look at how tight things are going to get this year when it comes down to cut down days and the big names that are eventually going to end up getting released and waived, Sam. Uh, Pretty nice. I can see the mindset and trying the trick they were trying to pull there, trying to save at least one roster spot, having a kicker slash punter there, Sam. That's a good call out. Forgot about that one. Number four on my list, August 29, 2020. Rick Spielman wheeled and deal the second and fourth round pick to the Jaguars for edge rusher Yannick Ngakwe. Huge move, Sam, especially for this front office. If you remember, really was not known for being super aggressive, acquiring players for picks unless they absolutely had to. And on paper, I mean, they definitely had to do something. Daniil Hunter shelved the entire year with that neck injury, if you remember. So here was the depth chart going into the year. Afedi Odenabo, DJ Wanham, Jalen Holmes and Eddie Yarborough. Yikes, man. (laughs) That just wasn't going to fly. So they cough up some premium picks for a pass rush specialist. He lasts six weeks, Sam. That's how long the experiment lasted. Two forced fumbles and five sacks in six weeks, by the way. Pretty good, if you ask me. Not bad. Pretty good. Splashy. Didn't fit the Zimmer defense, though, if you remember. Couldn't play the run whatsoever. Six weeks later, he was shipped off to Baltimore for a future third-round pick. Making a splash, though, right at the deadline for Yannick Ngakwe. That's number four on my list. Yeah, that'll pop up on mine eventually. That's a good poll. How about this one from 2018, my number four? Terrence Newman on cutdown day retires to become a coach. Now, retirement was the official word. I suspect that this was a suggested retirement. Hey, we we would we don't want to keep you, Terrence. Uh, would you like to join the coaching staff instead? We'll pay you like close to what you were going to make. Okay, sure. And you know why the Vikings did this, Luke? Because they had drafted Mike Hughes. They thought they were going to be set there, and they really liked Holton Hill. So they've got their six corners. They've got Hughes, Alexander, Waynes, Rhodes, Holton Hill, someone else whose name escapes me. That was their group. Terrence Newman just didn't have a place anymore. He was long in the tooth. Well, he becomes a coach, trying to coach up these defensive backs, and what happens? Mike Hughes tears an ACL in week four. Holton Hill was not reliable whatsoever. And Xavier Rhodes started to break down that year, if Mm -hmm. you remember. He came off the phenomenal 2017, which was, I think, the peak of his powers. And then the the decline began, and the injuries began. And that was the beginning of his downfall in Minnesota. They could have used Terrence Newman, man. 
I'm surprised, and maybe there's rules against this. I'm surprised that he didn't exchange the you know coaching ball cap for a helmet and for strap the jack him up strap. again that strap year. Strap him yeah. back up again, baby. Yeah. Put no, me and, in, and coach. again, hey, he was 39 years old at the time when he retired, going on 40, pushing 40, playing in the NFL, but. Duke could still ball, man. Duke could still play, fill in as a role player and, you know, a cornerback three or four at most if needed in those nickel and dime situations. Uh, It just goes to show what a great example you just called out of you can never have enough good cover cornerbacks, especially in the past happy league. You got four or five of these guys out on the field at any given time. And then when one or two, if not multiple go down, you got to have a backup plan in your back pocket. Terrence Newman, would have been great. That's a good call out there at number four. I like that. How many little uh, glances do you think Newman gave Zimmer as the secondary was falling apart? And again, I'm assuming that he was kind of forced into this. I think he was probably nudged out the door. How many times do you think he rolled his eyes oh, as boy. things oh, yeah. were going? And also, great potential Seinfeld humor in that room because they had a Jerry Gray and a Terrence Newman. <laughs> If you're a Seinfeld fan, you know where I'm I'm going with that. Hello, Jerry. Newman. That's my number four. What do you got for number three? Number three on my list. It's a two for one because these two guys were cut within one day of each other on the calendar year. Three years apart, though, Sam. And it was an end of an era. Both times these dudes were let go because they were staples when you think about Minnesota Vikings defense back in the 2010s. <sighs> These were the guys you thought of first and foremost, Sam. August 31st, 2018, Vikings wave Brian Robeson. Three years later, August 30th, 2021, Vikings wave Everson Griffin for what would be, if you remember how this kind of all finished up and wrapped up, Sam, the second and final time he left for Dallas and Detroit, a couple quick stints there the year prior. But between the two of those guys, Sam, you got 22 years of Vikings football and 120 sacks between both finish in the mm-hmm. Vikings top 10 in sacks all time. Um, it may have been two separate occasions. I get that. But each time one was let go, it was truly, it was the end of an era because these guys were not only fan favorites for so many people for so long, but cornerstones in the trenches of some of the best Vikings defenses we've ever seen. So the final goodbyes of Everson and Robeson, that's number three on my list. And it reminds you how rare it is for a player to be beloved by a team and then retire with that team. And I think Harrison Smith might be the one who pulls it off. Yep. Maybe he hang. And sometimes it's on the player to know when to hang it up. Like Joe Maurer, for instance, could have kept playing, Yep. but he chose to hang it up and retire a twin. Um, Maybe Harrison Smith pulls it off, but it is so hard to last the whole time in one city. And usually it ends Sometimes with bitter feelings, like Everson Griffin was bitter that first year, and then he eventually came back for a second stint, but and then it didn't end well that time either. Both uh, fourth round picks, too, by the way, just yeah. random fourth round picks. Uh, let's take a flyer on this guy. Go on to put up 22 years in Vikings uniforms, 99 questions with B Rob, man. Some of the best locker room interviews you'd ever find, still to this day. Have the Vikings had a great defensive line? Draft pick since Daniil. I mean, let, you know, you go through the list. Okay, they tried Jalen Holmes. You know, DJ Wanham, yeah. Asezi's nope. kind of nope. still in the mix. Janarius Robinson, nope. I remember nope. him. Patrick Jones, Jalen Twyman, uh, James Lynch. I mean, I could but, go on and on. I yeah. feel like Kenny Willekes. And again, a lot of these are day three picks. But Armin Watts, remember, he had a lot of hype coming in there as well. Um, gosh, not really, Sam. You're right, not really. Ade Aruna from Tulane, six-rounder, 2018. They, they just had a great run where yeah. they just nailed all of those guys. And yeah, then Jaleel Johnson. eight years of famine. And it sounds like they haven't really tried above the fourth round since Daniil either. No, you're right. If you're I'm... right. Not, not much. I, I think, and this is what happens too. And you saw this with the interior offensive linemen when they nailed a guy like John Sullivan, in the sixth, seventh round from Notre mm-hmm. Dame. And they're like, you know what? You start to think in your head, I can do this. I think I have a little advantage. I think there's a little tell in here, and I can find some late-day gems at this specific position on day three. So they tried forever with the interior linemen as well on day three, and they couldn't hit any guys. And then it's like, okay, I hit Brian Robeson in the fourth, hit Everson Griffin in the fourth. I think I know what I'm doing here. I know what to look for here, and I can let my coaches develop this talent. 
it just didn't work after that. You're right. It just, I don't want to say it proved to be a fluke by any means because still got Daniil Hunter and Rick Spielman had a couple just out of this world draft classes, that 2015 draft class. But yeah, in general, the, after that, you're right, Sam, especially the last seven, eight years, throwing a lot of darts up on the board on those day three defensive end, defensive line picks and uh, striking out quite a bit. Yeah, that they've had to rely very heavily on free agency. Um, mm -hmm. We're at the halfway point. And that's where we tell you about bird dogs. It's a bird dogs day on lockdown sports, Minnesota bird dogs. Make me look great. It's a hundred degrees out right now, Luke, a hundred degrees, but I've got those breathable bird dogs shorts. They look like khakis, but they're a little slimmer. They hug the thigh. Give me a sculpted look. I wear them out to uh, to TCO at practice. I'm turning some heads. I think maybe not. Maybe they're not actually looking at me or maybe they are because of my bird dogs. Uh, they're basically like Lululemon. They, they do similar things, but they fit better. And I can attest to that. Um, they're better than regular shorts with that stiff, restricting cotton. They've got the cloud knit fabric. Give you that slimmer look, but you don't sacrifice any movement. So you stay agile, stay mobile. Uh, Anti-stink sweat wicking fabric. That comes in handy when it's 110 heat index. So... Bird Dogs is a great promotion right now. Birddogs.com slash locked on. Get the free white tech hat. Wear it forwards, wear it backwards. Uh, it fits great. Adjustable in the back. It's very cool. Clean logo on the front. And you get that for free with any order. Birddogs.com slash locked on. Birddogs.com slash locked on. Get your free hat. Get your bird dogs, the shorts, the pants, the liner, everything. You won't want to take them off. I promise. Halfway point, we commence with my number three, and it's Yannick Ngakwe, who came up with, as your number four, I believe, and Ngakwe acquired for the second and the conditional fifth, which I think turned into a fourth. Uh, and then the crazy thing about that saga is the trade to the Ravens six weeks later. They gave it six weeks and they lost value in the process because they had to give up a second, and then they did get a third and conditional fifth back, but they had to move down in the draft order. Five sacks was nice. I looked at his tackling grades, though, for those six weeks. 114 out of 122 defensive ends in tackling. He was not interested at all in the run game. Might have been well-suited for a 3-4 because he liked to just stand on the edge and try to get those open lanes to the quarterback, but he was not going to set an edge. Uh, he was not going to sacrifice his shoulders, his body to make a tackle. Nope, not going to happen. Uh, and Gakwe has become quite a journeyman in the league too. Like no one wants to really commit to him or hang on to him. And it's hard to really understand why maybe it's the effort, but it didn't really work out in Minnesota. I remember Andre Patterson saying early on, yeah, I'm going to make him play my style of defense. And he didn't do that. He played the Anik Ngakwe style of defense. And uh, again, they were, they were trying. This was kind of like the Sam Bradford, like last second ditch effort. And uh, it didn't come out looking good for the Vikings. That's my number three. Yeah. And and the more I think about it too, he's in Indy right now, by the way, I believe anyways. Chicago. He oh, he's in Chicago now. Man, another team. That'll be what? Six teams? Six yeah. teams, I believe. And in, in about so. eight eight seasons. Yeah. Talk about the uh, immaculate grid. Perfect answer right there. But um, it surprises me, Sam, in a league that is so committed to finding guys that can carve out one specific unique role with so many sub packages that a guy that plays a premium position and offers a premium trait of getting after the quarterback, 65 career sacks. What do we got? 21 career force fumbles um, that he can't find you know, a landing spot and a home for multiple years at a time. Just goes to show you again how bad his tackling, the run effort, things like that must be for him to flop around team to team like that, being so good and as durable. A, a pass rush specialist. Yeah, and durable as well. You're right, totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, go uh, ahead. Number two. Yeah, number two on my list. Just a year ago, total mayhem, dude. Yeah, I can't pick just one. First, it was the bombshell of not one, not two, but three Former third-round picks just a year ago, third-round picks, three of them, all waived. Chas Surratt, 
who looks good, by the way, in New York right now, Wyatt Davis, and of course, Kellen Mann. Kwesi was just getting warmed up, though, Sam. A trade for Nick Mullins, then a trade for Ross Blacklock, then his biggest move ends with a bang. Trades for Jalen Rager. Three big cuts, followed by three big trades. And again, that all happened within a week of one another, and it all started exactly one year ago at this time. So that's number two on my list, Sam, the 2022 mayhem. Quasi's first big splashy cut down day. And now yeah. it's got us all pumped up. We're yeah. ready for more moves. Uh, could easily just be radio silent, but I think people are wondering about Kareem Hunt, Dalton Reisner, Trey Lance. Again, if he was going to make a couple of those moves, he should have made them earlier. Like he should have gotten Reisner into the building, should have gotten Kareem Hunt into the building earlier so they wouldn't have to learn at the last second. Um, but again, is we're, it we're... just a money thing? Like uh, these guys want to hold out for more money. Maybe if we wait a little bit longer, we can get them on a cheaper deal once they realize, okay, nobody else wants us. Let's just take the deal Quasi and the Vikings offered up. I, I don't know what it is. Yeah, cr- creating the relationship so that when they do soften on their demands, maybe they circle back mm-hmm. and have good feelings about the Vikings. But uh, I think Quasi is just repulsed by giving one cent too much to to a player that he does not value at a certain figure. Uh, Kwesi comes across like a nice guy, but I think he's a pretty uh, cutthroat negotiator. That's that's the vibe I'm getting Mm -hmm. so far, based on TJ Hawkinson, Daniil Hunter, and all that. Uh, My number two, Sammy B. Bradford. Sam Bradford, 2016. Vikings signed him in desperation because they didn't want to have Sean Hill be their uh, quarterback, Luke. They were coming off a division title. They had Super Bowl aspirations. They were opening up a new stadium. You think Sean Hill was going to be the guy to open up that new stadium against the Packers? No. Sam Bradford, in exchange for a first and a conditional fourth-round pick, comes to the Vikings from the Eagles, and 15 days after he joins the team, he starts against Green Bay and leads the Vikings to a win. You could argue that this was a great move for the Vikings. They got a career-best season out of Sam Bradford statistically. Now, unfortunately, the win-loss record collapsed. They missed the playoffs. But they squeezed a lot out of him, man. 71.6% completion percentage, 20 to 5, touchdown to interception ratio, very risk-averse, ultra-conservative quarterback. But he played a full season, which was rare for him. Um, and they had a chance. I mean, they were they started the season 6-0, and Luke. 6-0. and Yeah, that was wild. Yeah. Yeah, crazy the way it ended. Um, but the Sam Bradford move to replace the injured Teddy Bridgewater that season, number two for me. Yeah, that's number one on my list as well. And you made a lot of great points already. But I think when you look at the biggest moves in the last decade, and it happened September 2nd, 2016, you you called it out. Teddy Bridgewater goes down with that. Still to this day, by the way, freakiest one in a million leg injury coming off that division win, high aspirations. It's year three of Mike Zimmer in that era now, new stadium. Sean Hills, the backup quarterback, when a guy goes down in the quarterback room, who you going to call? Sam Bradford. When you need a win and the roster's good, who you going to (laughs) call? Sam Sam Bradford. Bradford. First and a fourth. I mean, former number one overall pick. A lot of hype around this guy. I just got... He's just got to stay healthy. That's it, man. Former Heisman Trophy winner comes in, plays 15 games that first year, goes seven and eight, which I get it, not great, but 20 to five TD to interception ratio. Again, obviously seven and eight is not great, not what you want. The stats were solid though, man. Almost 4,000 passing yards, four to one TD to interception ratio. And to do all that, by the way, think about it. Coming in a week before the season started to have to learn that entire playbook. You got no chemistry going on whatsoever with your receivers, with your center, the offensive line, the coaches for that matter. At the quarterback position, Ola, that was just so impressive, man. And the dude could just sling it, by the way. He just couldn't stay healthy. So that was the biggest but you know, splash for me by far. We've seen in the preseason. I'm very curious mm-hmm. to know what your number one is. But the trade for Sam Bradford, number one on my list. Well, I, I opened up the door to go back a little further for mine. So you you did a decade, and and that's great. But we got to mention the other big QB acquisition in 2009, going back 14 years when they of picked course. up Brett Favre. That's, oh, that's the number one with a bullet. Um, had to mention it. 
Brett Favre comes in and signs, and this is the comical part of it. You remember what the contract was to bring in Brett Favre? Like, first, what do you think it would be today? Well, I'm I'm thinking about the Aaron Rodgers to the Jets, or I mean, at least at the end, Rodgers with the Packers was what like fifty million, and then he trimmed it down to like thirty million a year just to save some room, help the team, and cap out. Is that right? So I'm thinking around yeah. that range ish. You know, like a uh, was it a one year or two yeah. year deal? Favre it was a two year deal for Favre. Okay, so I would guess, and I don't remember at all. I would guess a two year. Thirty-eight million dollar deal, which is probably way light. That is way heavy. Really, Brett Favre signed two years, twenty-five million. Wow, twelve that's million it. one year, thirteen million the other year. Wow, nice tidy amount. And I think that was pretty generous at the time. Like, think I of how you're talking times have changed. Yeah, thirteen, fourteen years ago, man. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. It's crazy how big the cap has gotten, and it's only going to keep getting bigger too, Sam. Which is crazy to think how just wild and crazy some of these contracts are. Think about if you played in the seventies or eighties and you saw some of these contracts go up. Think about if you played baseball in the seventies or eighties and you see Alex Rodriguez yeah. back in the day even signed that first three hundred million dollar contract, and now it's Shohei Otani and all these guys. These contracts are just getting silly, man. Just downright dumb. Yeah. Well, you talk to any of like the old Vikings from the Bud Grant days, and they all say, "Oh, if we had just played today, you know, they had to go oh, yeah. find other jobs after their careers." Yeah. Uh, which is wild, but no. Also, it reminds you how much we get lied to because, like, in the Sam Bradford instance, they were claiming they were okay with Sean Hill. They said with a straight face, "We're going to go forward with Sean Hill." In 2009, they said, "We're going forward with." Tavares or Sage Rosenfels? Nope. Nope. They're always looking to upgrade. They always know when the quarterback is not going to get the job done and they're looking for the best possible outcome. Uh, they went and got Brett Favre. Two years. $25 million. Turned out to be great value uh, after what he delivered in that season. But that's my number one. Let us know what we forgot, where we messed up in the comments section on YouTube. Also find us free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to our everydayers who tune in so religiously. Uh, for this show, it's the Every Weekers. We're on every Thursday, but we got the Minnesota football party coming up next with Arif Hassan, Luke Braun, and Ron Johnson, the full panel, talking Minnesota Vikings joint practices and maybe a little Trey Lance. He's Luke Inman, at Luke underscore Spinman on Twitter slash X. I'm Sam Ekstrom, at Sam Ekstrom. Thanks for watching slash listening. Talk to you next week on Minnesota Sports Rankum.